A warm summer afternoon in 1967, a 17-year-old goes swimming with her sister on the Chesapeake Bay and just swims right out to this raft anchored a few yards offshore, pulls herself up onto it, takes this stupid dive into very shallow water. Johnny! I knew right then and there that, um, boy, my life had changed forever. My doctor said, Johnny, you are going to be paralyzed for the rest of your life without using your hands or your legs. God, I can't live like this. I will not live this way. Because I couldn't hold razors or push pills down my throat, I knew I couldn't end my life physically. So I was strongly tempted to end my life emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I was strongly tempted to just lay in bed, turn on the air conditioner, tell my mother to turn out the lights, and just shut the door. Finally, in that darkness behind that closed door, I realized I can't live like this. God, show me how to live. My only anchor was the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. And like a suction cup, I just pressed myself up against that verse, okay, God, I am gonna give thanks today. Small things, small steps, moving forward, one bit at a time. And oh my goodness, as I exercise this little bit of obedience and giving thanks, my face stretches, it grows, my perspective widens, the world gets bigger as I take bigger steps and thank God for more things, greater things, and life begins to change. And that was a wonderful day when I opened the door and wheeled out of that dark bedroom and began to embrace life. I discovered that there are an awful lot of other disabled people in dark bedrooms who need to embrace life. And I've got a wonderful team of people at Johnny and Friends who are helping them to do just that because if there's a church in their area that needs to reach out to a family with a disability, then hey, we at Johnny and Friends will help them. Or if there's a family in a community, a, a mom and dad whose marriage is breaking apart because of a disabled kid, then we'll scholarship them. We'll send them to a family retreat. Or if there's a nursing home and folks are languishing without hope and feeling despair, then we'll send them special delivery. We'll give them Bibles. We'll give them the love of God. Or, or maybe if they can only reach so far as to turn a radio knob on their bedside table, then they can listen to the Johnny and Friends radio program. Or if there's a child in Albania who doesn't have a wheelchair, or a grandmother in Guatemala who's being pushed around in a wheelbarrow, then we will give them a wheelchair. We'll give them a Bible. That's our passionate Johnny and Friends. To embrace life means to embrace Christ and to embrace the circumstances he puts us in. And I want to share that message, whether through speaking or singing, writing, painting, you name it. You give me somebody, anybody, and I will tell them that God's power can show up best in their weakness, too. What a warm welcome. Thank you so much, friends from Westgate and also all of you visitors. What an awesome assembly of God this is. Ah, I was just having such fun sitting over there uh, singing the worship songs, and I want to thank Pastor Steve and this incredible church that has such a heart for reaching special needs families with the Lord Jesus Christ love. And this church sends lots of volunteers to our Mission Springs Family Retreat who here has either been to Mission Springs Family Retreat as a family or maybe served as a volunteer? May I see some hands? Oh, good, lots of hands, wonderful. Well, for the rest of you, you'll learn a little bit more about that tonight. But I wanna open our time together in prayer. If you don't mind, I, I've been in this wheelchair for 45 years. That's a long time. And oh my goodness, I'm feeling the crunch of older age and my weakness, and yet, God's power always shows up best in weakness, and I need his strength in my inability tonight. So would you pray with me just for a moment? Oh, Father God, we, we, you know, just all of us present to you our weaknesses tonight. I don't present just my quadriplegia, but all of us who feel crippled by our own life circumstances, handicapped in some way, maybe not with a broken neck, but with a broken heart or a broken home. I don't know what the brokenness is, but all of us 
as a, as a family of God, we just present to you, Lord Jesus, our weaknesses. Oh, Father, would you show up big time and show us, teach us, encourage us, inspire us, refresh us, and give us some new insight into your love, Lord God, that at the end of this time together, we'll be filled with praise, effervescing our hallelujahs to you for all that you are and all that you give. Thank you for your grace being sufficient. In your name, amen. You know, I, uh, when Pastor Steve asked us to turn around and, and uh, greet people, I, I greeted a young woman over there on the third road back, commented on her incredible harmony. I had never heard that song, Avalanche, but I love coming to an assembly like that, this, always to learn some new song, because I like to sing. I sing a lot. But I'll tell you a secret, I sing because I have to sing. I think back on much darker days you saw in that video, days after I broke my neck in that diving accident and crunched my spinal cord, leaving me paralyzed without use of my hands or use of my legs. At night in the hospital, I wanted so much to cry. But when you're paralyzed and your hands don't work and you can't wipe your own nose or, or or wipe your eyes, you don't want to cry because being paralyzed is bad enough without being messy and paralyzed. <laughs> so instead, I would just sniff it up, sniff back my tears, and I used to sing an old hymn. You friends might not know it, but I learned it as a child in church. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And that was my earnest plea back then. Oh, Jesus, don't pass me by, please. And I guess the reason I so love that hymn is because it reflected to me a very favorite portion of scripture. And in fact, during the daytime hours when Visitors would come and see me, and they would bring their Bibles, and they would ask if there was anything I wanted to hear from God's Word. I always, always ask them to please read to me from John chapter 5. And when I read it, I think you'll understand why that hymn was so much on my heart. For John chapter 5 says, Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. I gotta stop right here, isn't that amazing? The Lord of the universe thinks that being paralyzed for 38 years is a, quote, long time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What must he think about me being in this chair for 45 years? Wow. Anyway, when Jesus learned that this man had been in this position for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Then Jesus said to him, get up and walk. Can you see why I so was drawn to that portion of scripture. I was like so many special needs families, even today, quadriplegia, multiple sclerosis, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. These are hard things to deal with. And so often people with disabilities and their families, or perhaps even you in your own hardship, you look at God one of either two ways. Either you fault him for allowing such an awful thing to happen like, God, you're supposed to be good and powerful. So if your power could have prevented this from happening, how can you be good in allowing it to occur? We either fault him for allowing awful things to happen when he could stop them, or, or you beg him for healing. Oh, God, get me out of this circumstance. Get me out of this marriage. Get me out of this job. Get me out of this wheelchair. And that was me. I wanted God to explain himself, or I wanted him to heal me. And so many nights when I was in the hospital, I would picture myself in John chapter 5, right there at the Pool of Bethesda. I'd see myself 
lying there on a straw mat not too far away from that man paralyzed for 38 years. And I, in my mind's eye, would picture Jesus come walking in through those five covered colonnades, dressed in a rough burlap cloak, a rope belt, dusty, dirty sandals, and I'd see him bending and touching and healing the sick over there on the other side of the pool, and I would call out, Savior, here I am. Come over here where all the hard cases are. Heal us. <laughs> but you know, by the time I get out of that hospital, it was becoming clear to me I would not walk and I would ever, never use my hands. Needless to say, I plummeted into depression, and I think you can understand why. But still, I had enough faith to pray. And again, you saw it on the video, Lord, if I can't die, oh God, please show me how to live. Show me how to live. And I'm gonna tell you something upfront and honestly. For the last 45 years in this wheelchair, God has been showing me how to live. It, that, it's that simple. You don't believe me? You think I'm an expert at being quadriplegia? You think I'm a veteran at this? You think I've got all the answers and I know how to make it work? Listen, I'm no professional at being a person with a disability. No, let me, let, let me confess to you, 95% of the time how I wake up in the morning, and this is the gospel truth, I wake up and, and my eyes are still closed, okay? And you, you know that time in the morning. You, you, you experience it. Your head is on the pillow. Your eyes are closed. And you're thinking about the day ahead of you. And, and you know as well as I do, wars are fought and won in those few seconds before you open your eyes, right? <laughs> your attitude for the day is set. <laughs> and I'm lying there with my head on the pillow, my eyes closed, and I can hear my girlfriend in the kitchen running water for coffee, and I know she's gonna come into my bedroom in just a minute or two with a very cheery, happy hello and a cup of coffee, and I'm lying there thinking, oh God, I'm so tired. I, I can't, I, 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 I cannot face this. I don't know where I'm gonna get the strength. I just have no resources. I cannot do quadriplegia today. I cannot face another bed bath, more toileting routines, range of motion exercises, somebody getting me dressed, corseting my waist, sitting me up in a wheelchair, pushing me to the bathroom, brushing my teeth, brushing my hair. Oh God, I am so tired. I am so weary of life. I cannot do quadriplegia, but I can do all things through you as you strengthen me. I have no resources for this day, but you do. I have no strength for this day, but you do. Oh God, please, I have no smile for this woman who's gonna come into my bedroom in just a moment. May I please borrow your smile? And I'm gonna tell you something. By 7.35 in the morning, I have got joy hard fought for, hard won, and sent straight from heaven. It's, it's honest, it's deep, it's profound, it's real, it's settled in my soul, and it's not made out of Colgate, this smile. Uh-uh, when my girlfriend comes into the bedroom, I've got a smile said straight from heaven. I really do. And I do believe that that's the Christian way to wake up in the morning. That's the, that's the biblical way to wake up in the morning. That's the right way to wake up in the morning because maybe the really handicapped people are the ones who, when their alarm clock goes off, you know, they'll throw back the covers, jump out of bed, take a quick shower, scarf down breakfast, maybe give God a tip of the hat of a quiet time for five minutes, and then they're zooming out the front door on automatic cruise control. Did you know, Christian, that if you lived like that, God is against you? James chapter four, verse six, God opposes the proud. He resists the proud. Who are the proud? The proud are those people who, at one time in their lives, slap their sins on the counter for an asbestos-lined soul at the price of somebody else's blood. And now, thank you, God, I'll get on living my life as I please, but I'll check in with you every once in a while, and I promise I won't do anything too bad to shame your reputation. But you know what? I got this Christian thing figured out. God resists us when we think like that. He opposes the proud, he is against the proud, but 
yep, there's a but in James chapter four, verse six, but he gives grace, grace to the humble. And who are the humble? People who wake up in the morning knowing they need Jesus desperately. I cannot do this thing called life, God. It's hard. Show me how to live. Even Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very first Beatitude, blessed are you when you come to God in empty-handed spiritual poverty, for then yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's the secret to living with a disability, needing God desperately. And it is, I th in fact, I think, the secret to contentment. And that's why we all ought to be boasting in our afflictions, as the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. We all ought to be delighting in our infirmities. We all ought to be glorying in our limitations, for then we too know that God's power can rest on us. Let's not be ashamed of our weaknesses, right? Disabilities, or for that matter, whatever your hardship, these things drive us to God by the overwhelming conviction that we just ain't got nowhere else to go. I mean, I, I, I like to think of this wheelchair as, a, as a, 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 a sheepdog snapping at my heels, snarling and growling, driving me, herding me down the road to Calvary, where otherwise I would not be humanly, naturally inclined to go. None of us are humanly attracted to the cross. It repulses human nature because you've got to die to yourself if you embrace the cross. Who wants to do that? None of us is humanly inclined to do that. But oh, when we allow suffering, which I think is God's choicest tool to drive us to Calvary and our hardships by the overwhelming conviction that we just got nowhere else to go, when we allow suffering to push us to the cross and we embrace Christ there, lay down the sin, pride, stiff-necked, stubborn, self-resourcefulness, and say, I come all undone. I am down for the count decimated. I cannot do this. Lord God, take over my life. What a difference. What a difference he makes. And so our hardships become not only a sheepdog, they become a, 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 a jackhammer, kind of like breaking apart all of our rocks of resistance against God. Our suffering, our hardship becomes like a chisel chipping away at our pride. And if ever I wondered what God was doing way back in that hospital, that was it. That was it, my disability. Anyone's disability is the thing that God uses to force us down the road to Calvary. And it's what we do with Johnny and friends. We show people with disabilities how to deal with those hard issues. And best of all, we show them that there is more to God and his word than getting healed. I'm not saying that healing is a bad thing. When I got out of the hospital, I went to so many healing crusades. I was anointed with so much oil. I confessed so many sins. I started inventing sins so I could confess them. <laughs> and I would call, I'd call my friends up on the phone and say, be looking for me. I'm gonna be coming down your road walking. I mean, I just wanted to be a, lay it all out there and show people that I believed without a shadow of a doubt. But. There are more things to life, more important things than just walking or even using your hands. We show people with disabilities, special needs families, that God is good and he is worth trusting, he is worth following, and he is worth obeying. We show them that a disability can be an asset, not a liability, when it comes to growing in Christ. And I think the the biggest thing it shows us is that God owes us no explanations. Remember how I said I wanted answers from God? I don't know, even if God had given them, it would have helped. It would have been like pouring million gallon truths into my one ounce pea brain back then. I don't think I could have handled it. I couldn't have taken it all in, so I don't think we want answers. God owes us no explanations. He did all of his explaining on the cross of Christ. And so, when people with disabilities 
start peopling our pews with their wheelchairs and white canes and walkers. I like to think of them as God's flannel graphs to the church because people who suffer greater conflict always have something to say to those who suffer lesser conflict. And we become audiovisual aids, like my friend Carla Larson. Let me tell you about her real quick, talking about the way Johnny and Friends Family Retreats embraces people with disabilities. I, I learned that Carla was coming to Family Retreat when I read her registration form. Oh my goodness, the disabilities this woman had, all related to juvenile diabetes. She had lost both her legs amputated. She had lost five fingers on two different hands. She, she had lost a kidney. She'd had a heart attack. Her veins were collapsing. She had severe edema. She was legally blind. When I found her at Family Retreat, oh my goodness, I wheeled right up to her and said, Carla, I'm so glad you were able to make it. To which she replied, well, I thought I'd better come before I lost any more body parts. <laughs> This lady had such a good time. She and her family had such a blast at family retreat. It was so much fun having her there. And after family retreat was over, she, um, she sent me a note to tell me what a great time she had had. <laughs> and the note was tied to the toe of one of her old prosthetic feet. <laughs> and the note read, Dear Johnny, since all of me cannot be with all of you all of the time, part of me will have to do. <laughs> So many people at that family retreat were so inspired, so refreshed by Carla's sense of humor and buoyant optimism. They could see firsthand that, oh my goodness, if God's grace can sustain a woman with no legs, legally blind, half a kidney and a failing heart, then you know what? My problems aren't that bad. God's grace can sustain me. People with disabilities can be God's best audiovisual aid to others, not just those with disabilities, but anybody else in a congregation, showcasing that, when, showcasing that we're, we're all richer. All of us are richer when we recognize our poverty. All of us are stronger when we admit our weaknesses. And we are all wiser when we understand this, 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 this foolishness of God, as 1 Corinthians describes it. The foolishness of God that says, Look around you, who did God call into your numbers? Not the rich, not the noble, not the wise, not the influential, but the weak, the poor, the blind, the disabled. This is why Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 14, go out, find the disabled, lame, blind, and poor, and bring them in. I think he was so urgent about it because he knew these people would be good audiovisual aids to the rest of the congregation, describing how Jesus Christ is our strength, he is our richness and he is our wisdom. And also he is God's foolishness. Christ is God's wisdom. Christ is God's foolishness. God wrote the book on suffering and he called it Jesus Christ. As Dr. Peter Kreef said, God doesn't try to get himself off the hook when it comes to suffering, no. Jesus is God on the hook. Bruised and bleeding and battered, hammering hatred, Flies buzzing, dry blood. These aren't merely abstract, inner, mechanistic facts about the Lord Jesus. This is, as Thomas Merton said, love poured out like wine as strong as fire. And what does God call us to do when we embrace Jesus Christ? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 puts it best. To this you were called that is, the hardships that might be facing you, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so, as we follow in his steps, we are daily taking up our cross and dying to the sins that he died for on his cross. That's what it means to become, quote, like him in his death, as Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 describes it. We want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And there's no better way to become like him in his death than to daily take up your cross with an uncomplaining spirit and die to the sins that he died for on his cross. But oh my goodness. When you bring to the foot of the cross all the pride, all the self-resourcefulness, 
anxiety, fear, doubts of the future, questions, frustrations. When you bring your sin and pride, your, 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 your peevish attitudes, complaining spirit, oh my goodness, when you la allow Jesus to let that nail him to the cross, he then in turn pours out upon you such profound peace and joy indescribable, spilling and splashing over heaven's walls, filling your heart, effervescing up to God in a fountain of ecstatic praise and streaming out to others around you in rivers of encouragement. Those are the steps that lead to richness and wisdom and strength. And those are the steps that lead to contentment deep and abiding. And friend, there are so many people, people with special needs, people with disabilities who need to hear this message. They are so lost. I'm thinking just this week of the woman over in Sunnyvale, California. Maybe you read about it in the news this week. She had a son, a 22-year-old son with autism. And she was so overburdened, stressed out, weary of the day-to-day -day routine, finding no help, no encouragement, no social supports. And what did she do? But while her son lay in bed one morning, she shot him dead and then turned a gun on herself. And her husband comes back two hours later to find her. Oh my goodness, can you see? Ministry to people with disabilities is a life and death ministry. Just this week, a couple up in Oregon won a $2.9 million lawsuit against a medical laboratory clinic that failed to give a correct prognosis of the pre-pregnancy test that should have indicated that their unborn child was carrying a Down syndrome deficiency. And so they sued the clinic in what they called a, quote, wrongful birth suit. You've heard of wrongful deaths. This was a wrongful birth suit because they feel the lab should have told them that their child had Down syndrome because they would have aborted that child had they known. $2.9 million, oh my goodness. What, a, what has gone wrong? Something is so wrong. People are so fearful about disability and this fundamental fear of disability is somehow creating social policy now through court cases which now set frightening precedents for the future. We've got to get out there and reach these people and tell them about the good news. There are more than 1.5 million special needs families here in the Bay Area. And the mission statement of Johnny and Friends is to communicate the gospel and equip Christ-honoring churches worldwide, like right here at Westgate, to evangelize and disciple people affected by disability. Little wonder that Jesus said, go out quickly in Luke 14, not just go out and find the disabled, go out quickly quickly. I love that adverb, quickly. Do it fast. There's a sense of urgency. There's a critical, desperate need. People are languishing in despair and wanting so much to, to not face their day because they have no resources. They don't know Jesus, and we need to introduce them to Jesus. We're doing that at the Johnny and Friends Bay Area in a myriad number different of ways through training churches in how to do respite, that is providing a, a night off for a mom and dad while a child with a disability comes to church with other children and train volunteers, encourage and take care of those kids while mother and father get a break and maybe go out for dinner and at some respites, oh my goodness, mom and dad go out to the car in the church parking lot and sleep. That's, I'm not kidding. They actually sleep, they take a nap. They never get a break. And also, other training events, peer support groups, all kinds of ways we are helping, but also we're helping through our Mission Springs Family Retreats. We run two of them, the Bay Area does, down at the Mission Springs Conference Center in right north of Santa Cruz. And believe it or not, this spring when we opened up registration for these two family retreats, guess what? In two weeks, two weeks, the camps filled up. And we need a third family retreat. We really do. Now, I know they're going to be taking an offering here later, and, and I'm not sure how, how bold I am to be, be, be asking for an appeal, but you know what? God not only loves cheerful givers, he loves cheerful askers, and I'm asking for your help. We need help. 
we need your prayers, number one. We need you to volunteer down at Mission Springs, come and practice a little bit of Christianity with its sleeves rolled up, and we need your financial assistance. It's gonna be about $100,000 to pull up another family retreat in the year 2013. And what is it all about? Well, um, sometimes pictures really are better than lots of words. So take a look at this brief video that will showcase what family retreat down at Mission Springs really looks like. A disability in a family causes relentless stress and strain on everyone within that family. We have to choose to try to have a, a positive spin on the day. Because of the enormous pressures and relentless daily challenges of coping with disability, many of these families fall apart. One of the uh, benefits that we have seen of family retreats is it brings that parent into the context of other families, of a loving community of the body of Christ. They're not on this journey by themselves. These families need emotional support and respite from the overwhelming day-to-day -day pressures. They need a safe harbor in the storm where they can find rest and replenish the reserves needed to continue the battle to survive as a family. Johnny and friends provide such harbors at five-day family retreats held at locations across America and across the world in places like Romania, Ukraine, and Ghana, West Africa. We recruit short-term missionaries who come alongside each family to assist them and to free the other family members so they can take a break from their relentless daily routine to rest enjoy the activities in camp facilities, and take advantage of opportunities to network and share stories with others on similar journeys, to draw closer to Jesus through exploring scripture together, and to learn from workshops related to managing life affected by disability. Couples have time to enjoy and sometimes rekindle their relationships through the gift of having a break from their roles as caregivers. The first year I came, I met Olivia here, who's sitting beside me, my best friend, when she ran over my toe yeah. with her big wheelchair. Yeah. I led her to the yeah. Lord that day, and she's growing and loving spiritually in the Lord. You and your church can play a key role in bringing vital relief to families affected by disability. One way to do that is by sponsoring a family or short-term missionaries for a family retreat. Perhaps your church would like to partner with Johnny and Friends in leadership and programming for a retreat in your region, or invest in an international retreat, or even send short-term missionaries. Working with the local church and with retreat programs tailored to the local culture, Family Retreats is having the same impact on families in developing countries as we're experiencing in the U.S. Contact Johnny and Friends today. Yeah, that is worth applauding, absolutely. And the video is correct. We run 25 retreats for families affected by disability in the U.S. and 15 this summer will hold in developing nations uh, among special needs families who have so little, uh, who live in such abject poverty in developing nations. But the Johnny and Friends Bay Area team is responsible for the two family retreats down at Mission Springs. And why are we so passionate about this program? Well, I tell you what, we don't want someone's suffering to be nothing more than a precursor of even greater suffering that they may experience in a Christless eternity. We need to introduce these people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what motivate us, motivates us. That's what we're so passionate about. That's what I am so passionate about. 
oh my goodness, even though I've been in this wheelchair for four and a half decades, I wake up in the morning and after I get that smile from Jesus, I tell you what, I go into my day with great guns. I want to squeeze every ounce of ministry effort out of this paralyzed body that I possibly can to advance Christ's kingdom into what Satan thinks is his territory. Satan thinks that disabilities is his territory, his domain. I mean, he uses Down syndrome, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, arthritis, Alzheimer's, autism, to try to defame the good name of God, smear and stain his reputation. He uses disabilities as like ammunition to attack the goodness of God. But we and the church of Jesus Christ will not allow him to do that, uh-uh. Disabilities are not Satan's territory. They fall under the overarching decrees of a wise and sovereign God who although does not delight in suffering because he proved that when he sent Jesus to heal so much of suffering and relieve so much poverty. No, he, he, he doesn't delight in the suffering, but he will use it. God permits what he hates to accomplish that which he loves. And what does he love? That suffering will break the will and the pride of an individual to the point where they will come to the cross of Christ on bended, humble need and look up and say, I can't do it, Jesus. Please be the boss of my life. Sit on the throne of my heart. That's our passion at Johnny and Friends. Remember that story I shared in the beginning? The story about me seeing myself at the pool of Bethesda getting healed. Well, not too many years ago, my husband Ken and I, and by the way, Ken, would you stand up? And this is gonna be our 30th wedding anniversary this year. <laughs> my husband was so sweet, he took me to Israel for a summer tour, and oh my goodness, we had such a great time going up and down the the uh, Dead Sea and seeing the Jordan River and, and uh, Capernaum and, and Jericho. And we spent a whole day in the old city of Jerusalem. And I'll never forget, Ken uh, had me in my wheelchair bumpity bump bumping along those cobblestone streets in the bazaar of old Jerusalem. And we went down one narrow street and there on the right hand side was the Sheep Gate. We made a left hand turn, went past St. Anne's Church and all of a sudden we Oh my goodness, would you look at that? Oh, Ken, Ken, look, look at this. It's the pool of Bethesda. Oh my goodness, Ken, you wouldn't believe how many times when I used to be in the hospital, I would imagine myself here. Oh, look at this, would you? It's in ruins, but this is where Jesus walked. And I used to imagine myself as one of the paralyzed, desperately hoping that I would get physically healed. Nobody was there that day at the Pool of Bethesda. All the tour buses were gone. We had the place to ourselves. And I leaned against the metal guardrail overlooking the ruins. And as a dry wind tried to dry my tears because I was just bawling like a baby, I looked out over that scene and had an opportunity to say to Jesus, oh, Father, you're so gracious having brought me here because I want to tell you right here at the Pool of Bethesda where I imagined myself so many years ago, I want to tell you that a no answer from you for a request for physical healing has meant yes to so many other things that I would never have dreamed possible when I was in the hospital. A no answer to physical healing has meant yes to a deeper prayer life. It's meant yes to a love for others who are hurting, especially those with disabilities. It's meant yes to a deeper desire for your word and the things I can learn from it, a more earnest affection for the Savior, a livelier, more buoyant hope of heaven, compassion for others, a greater depth of joy, and most of all, contentment, sweet, deep, and abiding, and a love for you, dear Savior, that I never, ever would have experienced had you not driven me down the road to Calvary with this sheepdog of a wheelchair. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you because I have learned that there really are more important things in life than walking and having use of your hands. My challenge to you this evening, learn to see your hardships as an asset. 
Believe that God is good, even when he doesn't explain himself to you for all the hardships you face. Thirdly, wake up tomorrow morning joining me, needing Jesus desperately. And fourth, get involved with Johnny and friends. Volunteer with us, pray for us, give to our ministry, because we need you.